Section four of Miss Mink's Soldier and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Miss Mink's Soldier and Other Stories by Alice Hegan Rice. Hoodoo. Gordon Lee Surrender Jones lay upon what he confidently claimed to be his deathbed. Now and again he glanced furtively at the cabin door and listened. Being assured that nobody was coming, he cautiously extricated a large black foot from the bedclothes, and holding it near the candle, laboriously tied a red string about one of his toes. He was a powerful negro, with a close-cropped bullet head, a massive bulldog jaw, and a pair of incongruously gentle and credulous eyes. According to his own diagnosis, he was suffering from asthma, bronchitis, pneumonia, grip, diabetes, and old age. The last affliction was hardly possible, as Gordon Lee was probably born during the last days of the Civil War, though he might have been eighty for all he knew to the contrary. In addition to his acknowledged ailments, there was one he cherished in secret. It was by far the most mysterious and deadly of the lot, a malady to be pondered on in the dark watches of the night, to be treated with weird rites and ceremonies, and to be cured only by some specialist versed in the deepest lore of witchcraft. For Gordon Lee knew beyond the faintest shadow of a doubt that a hoodoo had been laid upon him of course like most of his race he had had experiences in this line before but this was different in fact it was no less a calamity than a cricket in his leg just how the cricket got into his leg was a matter too deep for human speculation but the fact that it was there and that it hopped with ease from knee to ankle and made excruciating excursions into his five toes was as patent as the toes themselves what complicated the situation for gordon lee was that he could not discuss this painful topic with his wife amanda jones had embarked on the higher education and had long ago thrown overboard her old superstitions she was not only queen mother of the sisters of the order of the star and an officer in various church societies but she was also a cook in the house of mrs james bertram president of the state federation of women's clubs the crumbs of wisdom that fell from the lips of the great mrs bertram were carefully preserved by amanda and warmed over with sundry garnishings of her own for the various colored clubs to which she belonged gordon lee had succeeded in adorning only three toes when he heard a quick step on the gravel outside and hastily getting his foot under cover he settled back on the pillow closed his eyes and began laboriously inhaling with a wheeze and exhaling with a groan the candle sputtered as the door was flung open and a small energetic mulatto woman twenty years gordon lee's junior bustled into the room good long but it's hot in here she exclaimed flinging up a window i got a good mind to nail this here window down from the top i done open the door for a spell this morning said gordon lee suddenly pulling the bedclothes tighter about his neck Letting in all this here night air makes my eyes sore. The bedclothes, having thus been drawn up from the bottom of the bed, left the patient's feet exposed, and Amanda immediately spied the string-encircled toes. Gordon Lee Surrender Jones, she exclaimed indignantly. Has that there meddling old Aunt Kizzy been here again? Gordon Lee's eyes blinked, and his thick, sullen under lip dropped half an inch lower if you think continued amanda furiously that i'm a-goin to keep on a-workin my fingers to the bone like i've been doin for the past year a payin doctor's bills and buyin medicines for you while you lay up in this here bed listenin to the fool talk of a passel of ignoramuses you certainly mistaken it's bad enough to have you studyin up new ailments every day without folks a puttin em in your head what them strings tied on your toes fur gordon lee's wheezing had ceased under his severe mental strain and now he lay blinking at the ceiling utterly unable to give a satisfactory answer aunt kizzy just happened long he muttered presently 
ain't no harm in an old friend passing the time of day. What them strengths had on your toes fur? repeated Amanda with fearful insistence. Gordon Lee pushed to the extreme, and knowing by experience that he was as powerless in the hands of his diminutive wife as an elephant in those of his keeper, weakly capitulated. Ain't Kizzy low. I ain't saying she's right. I just telling you what she low. Ain't Kizzy low dat cordin' to de symptoms, she say, and I ain't saying I believe her, but she say it looks like I suffering from a hoodoo. A hoodoo? Amanda's scorn was unbounded. If it don't beat my time how some of you niggers hang on them old notions, tain't nothing tall but ignorant superstition. Ain't I told you that a hundred times? Yes, you done told me, said Gordon Lee, putting up a feeble defense. You all time coiling and running down conjuring and bad luck signs and all de nigger superstitions. But you's quick enough to take up all these here white superstitions. How do you mean? demanded Amanda. Gordon Lee, flattered at having any remark of his noticed, proceeded to elaborate. I mean all this here talk bout it's bad luck to sleep with the window shut, and bout flies carrying disease, and bout worms getting in the milk if you leave it sitting round unkivered. Not worms, corrected Amanda. Germs. That ain't no superstition. That's a scientific fact. They is so little you don't see em, but they's there all right. Miss Bertram says they's everywhere, in the water, in the air, crawling up the very walls. Gordon Lee looked fearfully at the ceiling, as if he expected an immediate attack from that direction. I ain't saying they ain't, Amanda. Come to think of it, seems like I remember em scrunching against my teeth when I eats. I ain't saying nothing tall about white folks' superstitions. I spec they's true, every one of em. But it looked like you oughtn't to shit your mind against the colored signs that come down from your ma and your pa and your grandma and grandpa fur back as Adam. I spec Adam hisself was conjured, like as not the serpent done tricked him into regaling hisself with that apple. But I suppose you'd lay hit on de germs what was disportin' they selves on the apple. But there ain't no use in spootin' de pint, cause de fact remains that de apple's done it. I ain't astin' you to dispute nothin', cried Amanda, by this time in a high state of indignation. I'm a-talkin' scientific facts, and you're talkin' nigger foolishness. The ignorance just naturally oozes out in the pores of your skin. Gordon Lee, thus arraigned, lay with contracted brows and protruding lips, nursing his wrongs, while Amanda disappeared into the adjoining room, there to vent her wrath on the pots and pans about the stove. Despite the fact that it was after eight o'clock and she had been on her feet all day, she set about preparing the evening meal for her husband with all the care she had bestowed on the white folk supper. Soon the little cabin was filled with the savory odor of bacon, and when the corn batter cakes began to sizzle promisingly, and she flipped them over dexterously with a fork, Gordon Lee forgot his ill humor and through the door watched the performance with growing eagerness. Get yourself propped up, Amanda called, when the cakes were encircled with crisp brown edges. I'll get the breadboard to put across your knees. You'll be eating this soup while I dishes up the bacon and onions. How'd you like to have a little jam along with your apple dumpling? Gordon Lee, sitting up in bed, with this liberal repast spread on the breadboard across his knees, and his large bare feet, with their pink adornments, rising like ebony tombstones at the foot of the bed, forgot his grievance. Jam, he repeated. Well, dat there Sally Ann Slocum's dumplings may need jam, er Maria Johnson's, but dis here dumplin' is complete in itself. If they ever was a person dat could assemble a apple dumplin' so's you swallow it most afore it gets to your mouth, that person is you. Harmony being thus restored, and the patient having emptied all the dishes before him, Amanda proceeded to clear up. Her small energetic figure moved briskly from one room to the other, and as she worked she sang in a low chanting tone. You got a shoe, I got a shoe. All God's children got shoes. When I get to heaven, gwine try on my shoes. Gwine walk all over God's heaven, heaven, 
heaven everybody's talking about heaven ain't gwine to heaven 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 gwine walk all over god's heaven but the truce thus declared was only temporary during the long days that amanda was away at her work gordon lee had nothing to do but lie on his back and think of his ailments for twenty years he had worked in an iron foundry where his muscles were as active as his brain was passive now that the case was reversed the result was disastrous from an attack of rheumatism a year ago he had developed an amazing number of complaints all of which finally fell under the head of the dread hoodoo aunt kizzy the object of amanda's special scorn he held in great reverence she had been a familiar figure in his mother's chimney corner when he was a boy and to doubt her knowledge of charms and conjuring was to him nothing short of heresy she knew the value of every herb and simple that grew in hurricane hollow she was an adept in getting people into the world and getting them out of it she was constantly consulted about weaning calves and planting crops according to the stage of the moon and for everything in the heavens above and the earth beneath and the waters under the earth she had a sign since gordon lee's illness she had fallen into the habit of dropping in to sit with him at such hours as amanda would not be there she would crouch over the fire elbows on knees and pipe in mouth and regale him with hair-raising tales of hants and spirits and the part she had played in exercising them this here case of yon she said one day ain't no ordinary case i done worked on lizards in de legs but i never had no occasion to treat a cricket in de leg looks like de cricket is a more persistent animal than de lizard sides as i signify for dis here case of yon ain't no ordinary case why why ain't it gordon lee stammered apprehensively aunt kizzy lifted a bony black hand and shook her turbaned head ominously Days two kinds of hoodoos, she said, de libin and de daid. De daid ones is de easiest to lift, case day answers to charms, but nobody can lift a libin hoodoo cept in de one dat laid hit on. I been a steadyin and a steadyin and de signs claim dat dis here hoodoo ob yon ain't no daid hoodoo by this time the whites of gordon lee's eyes were largely in evidence and he raised himself fearfully on his elbow ain't kizzy he whispered hoarsely how am i gwine to find out who tis done conjured me by de sign of seven she answered mysteriously i's gwine home and work it out den i come back and tell yer if my suspicions am true dat dis here is a libin hoodoo de only power in de earth to take it off am ter get a bigger trick and lay on de top of it i gwine home now and i'll be back inside de hour that night when amanda returned home she found gordon lee preoccupied and silent he ate gingerly of the tempting meal she prepared and refused to have his bed straightened before he went to sleep how come you put your pillow on the floor she asked i ain't believin in feathers he answered sullenly they makes me hear things in vain amanda tried to cheer him she recounted the affairs of the day she gave him all the gossip of the order of the sisters of the star he lay perfectly stolid his horizontal profile resembling a mountain range the highest peak of which was his under lip finally amanda's patience wore thin what's the matter with you gordon lee surrender jones she demanded what do you mean by sticking out your lip like a circus camel now that the opportunity for action had come he feared to take advantage of it amanda small as she was looked firm and determined and he knew by experience that he was no match for her tain't for you to be asked to me what's the matter he began significantly the gloves on the other hand what you sinuate nigger cried amanda now thoroughly roused i's tired layin here under dis here spell complained gordon lee i knowed all along twas a hoodoo but i never spishin till to-day who was sponsible for it aunt kizzy tried to test and for de loud he pinted powerful near home 
Amanda sank into the one rocking chair the cabin boasted and dropped her hands in her lap. Her anger had given place for the moment to sheer amazement. Well, if this ain't the beatenest thing I ever heard tell of in all my born days, do you mean to say that that ornery old cross-eyed nigger Kizzy had the audacity to set up before my fire in my house and tell my husband I'd laid a spell on him? That's what the signs punt to, said Gordon Lee doggedly. Amanda rose, and it seemed to him that she towered to the ceiling. With hands on hips and head thrown back, she delivered herself, and her voice rang with suppressed passion. Yes, I laid a spell on yer. I laid a spell on yer when I let you quit work and lay up in bed with nothing to do but circulate your symptoms. I put a spell on yer when I nurse and feed you and sport you and spile the life plumb out in you. I ain't claimin' twasn't a rheumatism in the first place, but it's a spell now, all right. A spell I did lay on yer, a spell of laziness, pure and simple. After this outburst, the relations were decidedly strained in the little cabin at the far end of Hurricane Hollow. Gordon Lee persistently refused to eat anything his wife cooked for him, depending upon the food that Aunt Kizzy or other neighbors brought in. To Amanda, the humiliation of this was acute. She used every strategy to conciliate him, and at last succeeded by bringing home some pig's feet. His appetite got the better of his resentment, and he disposed of four with evident relish. With the approach of winter, however, other and graver troubles developed. The rent of the cabin, which had always been promptly paid out of Gordon Lee's wages, had now to come out of Amanda's limited earnings. Two years' joint savings had gone to pay the doctor and the druggist. Amanda gave up the joys of club life and began to take in small washings, which she did at night. Gordon Lee, surrounded by every luxury save that of approbation, continued to lie on his back in the white bed and nurse his hallucinations. Mandy, he said one morning as she was going to work, Wished you'd ask Marsh Jim if he got a old pair of pants he could spare me. Her face brightened. You fixin' to get up, honey? She asked hopefully. No, I's just collectin' of my grave clothes, said Gordon Lee. There's a pair of purple socks in the bottom drawer and a biled shirt in the wardrobe. But I been layin' here steadyin' about that shirt. It's got Marsh Jim's name on the tail of it. And s'pose I get to heaven, and St. Peter, he read de name, and look it up in de judgment book. He's liable to come to me and say, how come you were in that shirt? Dey ain't but one James Bartram writ down in de book, and he ain't no colored person. Cos I could explain, but I's got explain enough to do when I get to heaven without that. Amanda paused, with her hand on the doorknob. Marsh Jim will beat you to heaven, that is, if he don't beat you to the bad place first. You get that idea of dying out in your mind, and you'll get well. I can't get well till the hoodoo's lifted, and Kizzy lows. But the door slammed before he could finish. The limit of Amanda's endurance was reached about Christmas time. One gloomy Sunday afternoon, when she had finished the numerous chores that had accumulated during the week, she started for the coal shed to get an armful of kindling. Dusk was coming on, and Hurricane Hollow had never seemed more lonesome and deserted. The corn shocks leaned toward one another as if they were afraid of a common enemy. Somewhere down the road, a dog howled dismally. Amanda resolutely pushed open the door of the shed and felt her way toward the pile of chips. Suddenly, she found her progress blocked by a strange and colossal object. It was an oblong affair, and it stood on one end, which was larger than the other. With growing curiosity, she felt its back and sides, and then peered around it to get a front view. What she saw sent her flying back to the cabin with her mouth open and her limbs shaking. Gordon Lee, she cried, whose coffin is that settin' in our coal shed? The candidate for the next world looked very much embarrassed. Well, Mandy he began lamely. I can't say exactly his hits any persons just yet, but his gonna be mine when de summons comes. Where'd you get it at? 
demanded his nemesis. His eyes shifted guiltily. The foundry boss done been here last week, and he give me some money. I load I was laying hit up for a rainy day. And you mean to tell me, she cried, that you took that money and spent it for a coffin, a white one with shiny handles and a satin bolster that'll done be wore out and et up by moss for you ever get a chance it to use it. Couldn't you fix it up in terbacky or mothballs again to time I need it? Gordon Lee asked helplessly. But Amanda was too exasperated this time to argue the matter. Fifty dollars worth of coffin in the coal shed and fifty cents worth of coal in the bin constituted a situation that demanded her entire attention. For six months now, Gordon Lee had remained in bed, firm in the belief that he could not walk on account of the spell that had been laid upon him. During that time, he had come to take a luxurious satisfaction in the interest his case was exciting in the neighborhood. Being in excellent physical condition, he could afford the melancholy joy of playing with the idea of death. He spent hours discussing the details of his funeral, which had assumed in his mind the proportions of a pageant. Amanda, on the other hand, overworked and anxious, and compelled to forgo her lodges and societies, became more and more irascible and depressed. In some subtle way, she was aware that the sympathy of the colored community was solidly with Gordon Lee. Nobody now asked her how he was. Nobody came to the cabin when she was there, though it was apparent that visitors were frequent during her absence. Aunt Kizzy had evidently been busy in the neighborhood. One night, Amanda sat very long over the stove, rolling her hair into little wads about the length and thickness of her finger then tightly wrapping each with a stout bit of cord to take out the kink. When Gordon Lee roused himself now and then to inquire suspiciously what she was doing, she answered with ominous calm, Just steadying, that's all. Her meditations evidently resulted in a plan of action, for the next night she came home from her work in a most mysterious and unusual mood. Gordon Lee heard her moving some heavy and cumbersome article across the kitchen floor. Then he saw her surreptitiously put something into a tin can before she presented herself at the foot of his bed. Mandy, he said, anxious to break the silence and distrusting that subdued look of excitement in her eyes. Did you bring me dat possum like you load you was gwine to? Her lips tightened. Yes, I got the possum and some apples for a dumpling, but before I lays a stick to the fire, I'm going to say my say. Gordon Lee looked at her with consternation. She stood at the foot of his bed as if it were a rostrum, and with an air of detached dignity addressed him as if he had been the whole order of the Sisters of the Star. I done arrive at a decision, she declared. I arrive at it in the watches of the night. I'm going to cure you cordin' to your lights and knowledge. I'm going to lift that spell if I has to purge my mortal soul to do it. Mandy, cried Gordon Lee eagerly, you mean to say you gwine to remove the hoodoo? I am, she said solemnly. I'm going to draw out all your miseries for the rest of your life, including of the cricket in your leg. Mandy, he cried again fearfully, you ain't gwine to hurt me in no way, is you? Not effin' you do as I tell you, but first of all, you got to take the pledge of silence. Whatsomever takes place here in this cabin tonight ain't never to be revealed till the judgment day. Do you swear? The big negro, fascinated with the mystery and deeply impressed with his wife's manner, laid his hand on the Bible and solemnly took the oath. Now, she continued impressively, while I go in the kitchen and get the supper started, I want you to ease yourself out in the bed onto the floor and lay with your head to the north and your hands outspread and your mind on the heavenly kingdom. Are you sure it ain't gwine hurt me? Again he queried. Not if you do exactly like I say. Besides, she added dryly, if it comes to the worst, ain't you ready and waiting to go? Yes agreed Gordon Lee, but I ain't fixin' to go till I sent fur. 
it took not only time but courage for him to follow the prescribed directions he had for a long time cherished the belief that any exertion would prove fatal but the prospect of having the hoodoo removed together with the lively curiosity as to what means amanda would employ to remove it spurred him to persist despite groans wheezes and ejaculations once stretched upon the floor with his head to the north and his arms extended he encountered a new difficulty his mind refused to dwell upon the heavenly kingdom anxiety as to the treatment he was about to be subjected to alternated with satisfaction at the savory odors that floated in from the kitchen if the ordeal was uncertain the reward at least was sure after what seemed to him an endless vigil amanda appeared in the doorway with measured steps and great solemnity of mien she approached holding in her right hand a piece of white chalk the hour has come she chanted with this chalk and around this man i make the mark of his image stooping she began to trace his outline on the dull rag carpet speaking monotonously as she worked gordon lee surrender jones i command all the aches and pains all the miseries and fool notions includin the cricket in your leg to pass out in your real body into this here image on the floor keep your head still nigger i pass em through you into your symbol and from thence i draws em out to satisfy your mind now and for evermore amen now roll over to the right and watch what's about to happen the patient by this time was so interested that he followed instructions mechanically he saw amanda dart into the kitchen and emerge with an object totally unfamiliar to him it was a heavy box-shaped object attached to a long handle this she placed on the chalked outline of his right leg then she stood with her eyes fixed on the floor and solemnly chanted draw draw according to the law lift the hoodoo now i beg and draw the cricket from this here leg and gordon lee raised on his elbow watching with protruding eyes heard it draw he heard the heavy panting breathing as amanda ran the vacuum cleaner over every inch of the chalked outline and when she stopped and kneeling beside the box removed a small bag of dust and lint he was not in the least surprised to see a cricket jump from the debris praise be he cried in sudden ecstasy de pain's done left me de spell's done lifted and the cricket's done removed urged amanda skillfully getting the machine out of sight you seen it removed with your own eyes with my own eyes echoed gordon lee still in a state of self-hypnosis and now she said i'm going to get that supper ready just as quick as i can ain't you gwine to help me back in bed fust he asked from where he still lay on the floor what fur she exclaimed ain't the spell lifted i'm going to set the table in the kitchen and if you wants any of that possum and sweet potato and that apple dumpling and hard sass you got to walk in there to get em for ten minutes gordon lee surrender jones lay flat on his back on the floor trying to trace the course of human events during the last half hour against the dim supposition that amanda had in some way outwitted him rose the staggering evidence of that very live cricket that still hopped about the room chirping contentedly twice amanda spoke to him but he refused to answer his silence did not seem to affect her good spirits for she continued her work singing softly to herself despite himself he became aware of the refrain and before he knew it he was going over the familiar words with her oh chicken pie and pepper oh chicken pie is good i know so is watermelon too so is rabbit in a stew so is dumplings bowled with squab so is corn bowled on the cob so is china and turkey breast so is eggs just from the nest gordon lee rose unsteadily holding to a chair he reached the table then the door through which he shambled and sheepishly took his old place at the foot of the table amanda outdid herself in serving him emptying the larder in honor of the occasion but neither of them spoke until the apple dumpling was reached then gordon lee turned toward her and said confidently i wished we knowed some corpse we could sell that coffin to end of hoodooed
Recording by Myra Parker. Section 5 of Miss Mink's Soldier and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miss Mink's Soldier and Other Stories by Alice Hagen Rice. A Matter of Friendship. When a jovial young person in irreproachable Pongee and a wholly reproachable brown topi scrambled up the lifting gangplank of the big Pacific liner setting sail from Yokohama, he was welcomed with acclaim. The captain stopped swearing long enough to megaphone a greeting from the bridge. The first officer slapped him on the back, while the half-dozen sailors tugging at the ropes grinned as one man. Three months before, this good ship East India had carried Frederick Reynolds out to the Orient and deposited him on the alien soil, an untried youth of unimpeachable morals with a fatal facility for making friends. The temporary transplanting had had a strange and exotic effect. The East has a way of developing crops of wild oats that have been neglected in the West, and by the end of his sojourn Mr. Frederick Reynolds had seen more, felt more, and lived more than in all of his previous twenty-four years put together. He had learned the difference between a straight flush and a full house, under the palms at Raffles Hotel in Singapore. He had been instructed in the ways of the wise in Shanghai by a sophisticated attaché of the French legation, who imparted his knowledge between sips of absinthe as he looked down on the passing show from a tea-house on the bubbling well road he had rapturously listened to every sweet secret that japan had to tell and had left a wake of smiles from nagasaki to yokohama in fact in three short months he was fully qualified to pass a connoisseur's judgment on a highball to hold his own in a game of poker and to carry on a fairly coherent flirtation in four different languages. With this newly acquired wisdom he was now setting sail for home, having accomplished his downward career with such alacrity that he did not at all realize what had happened to him. Nor did the return voyage promise much in the way of silent meditation and timely repentance, the captain placed Reynolds next to him at table, declaring that he was like an electric fan on a sultry day. The purser, with the elasticity of conscience peculiar to pursers, moved him from the inexpensive inside room which he had engaged to a spacious stateroom on the promenade deck, where sufficient corks were drawn nightly to make a small life-preserver. The one person who watched these proceedings with disfavor was a short, attenuated, bow-legged Chinaman, with a face like a grotesque brass knocker, and a taciturnity that enveloped him like a fog. On the voyage out, Song Fu, the assistant deck steward, had gotten into a fight with a brother Chinaman, and had been saved from dismissal by Reynolds' timely intercession at headquarters. In dumb gratitude for this service, he had laid his celestial soul at the feet of the young American and sworn eternal allegiance. From the day Reynolds re-embarked, Song's silken, slippered feet silently followed him from smoking-room to bar, from bar back to smoking-room. Whatever emotion troubled the depths of his being, no sign of it rose to his ageless, youthless face. But whether he was silently performing his duties on deck, or sitting on the hatchway smoking his opium, his vigilant eyes, from their long, narrow slits, kept watch. For thirteen days the sun sparkled on the blue waters of the Pacific, and favoring breezes gave every promise of landing the East India in port with the fastest record of the season bets went higher and higher on each day's running, and the excitement was intense each evening in the smoking-room when the numbers most likely to win the next day's pool were auctioned off to the highest bidder. It was the afternoon of the fourteenth day, thirty-six hours out from San Francisco, that Mr. Frederick Reynolds, who had bet more, drunk more, talked more, and laughed more than any man on board, suddenly came to his full senses. Then it was that he went quietly to his luxurious stateroom with its brass bed and crimson hangings and took a forty two caliber revolver from his steamer trunk. Slipping a cartridge into the cylinder, he sat breathing heavily and staring impatiently before him. From outside, 
Above the roar of the ocean came the tramp of the passengers on deck, and the trivial scraps of conversation that floated in kept sidetracking his thoughts, preventing their reaching the desired destination. The world, which he had sternly resolved to leave, seemed determined to stay with him as long as possible. He heard Glass, the actor, inquiring for him, and in spite of himself he felt flattered. He heard the pretty girl, whose steamer chair was next his, make a conditional engagement with the high-voiced army officer, and he knew why she left the matter open. Even a plaintive old voice inquiring how long it would be before tea caused him to wait for the answer. At last, as if to present his misery in embodied form, he produced a notebook and tried to concentrate his attention upon the items therein recorded. Line after line of wavering figures danced in impish glee before him, defying inspection. But at the foot of the column, like soldiers waiting to shoot a prisoner, stood four formidable units unquestionably pointing his way to doom. As he looked at them, Reynolds' thoughts got back on the main track and rushed to a conclusion. Tearing the leaf from the book and crushing it in his hand, he jumped to his feet. Seized with a fury of self-disgust, he pulled off his coat and collar, and with the reckless courage of a boy, put the mouth of the revolver to his temple. As he did so, the room darkened. He involuntarily looked up. Framed in the circle of the porthole were the head and shoulders of Tsang Fu. Not a muscle of the yellow face moved, not a tremor of the slanting eyelids showed surprise. The right hand, holding a bit of tow, mechanically continued polishing the brass around the porthole. But the left, long, thin, and with claw-like nails, shot stealthily forward and snatched the pistol. For a full minute the polishing continued. Then face and figure vanished, and Reynolds was left staring in impotent rage at the empty porthole. When the room steward appeared in answer to an imperative summons, he was directed to send Tsang Fu to room number seven at once. Tsang came almost immediately, bearing tea and anchovy sandwiches, which he urbanely placed on a camp stool. "'Where's my pistol?' demanded Reynolds hotly, holding to the door to steady himself. Tsang's eyes, earnest as a dog's, were lifted to his. "'He fall overboard,' he explained suavely. "'Mi vele sali.' Reynolds impulsively lifted his arm to strike, but a second impulse, engulfing the first, made him turn and fling himself upon his berth, struggling to master the heavy sobs that shook him from head to foot. The Chinaman softly closed the door and slipped the bolt, then he dropped to a sitting posture on the floor and waited. When the squall had passed, Reynolds addressed his companion from the depths of the pillows in language suited to his comprehension. "'Me belong large fool, Song," he said savagely. "'Have drink too much. No good. You go long. I'm all right now.' Song's eye swept the disordered room and returned to the figure on the bed. "'Suppose me go,' he said. "'You make you one hole in head?' "'That's my business,' said Reynolds, his wrath rekindling. "'You go long, and get my pistol. There's a good chap.' Song did not stir. He sat with his hands clasped about his knees and contemplated space with the abstract look of a Buddha gazing into nirvana. Reynolds passed from persuasion to profanity with no satisfactory result. His language, whether eloquent or fiery, beat upon an unresponsive ear. But being in that condition that demands sympathy, he found the mere talking a relief, and presently drifted into a recital of his woes. I'm up against it. In the hole, you know. Much largey trouble." He amplified with many gestures, sitting on the side of his berth and pounding out excited, incoherent phrases to the impassive figure opposite. Company sent me out to collect money. My have spent all. No can go back home. Suppose my lose face, more better die. Tsang shifted his position and nodded gravely. Out of much that was unintelligible, the last sentence loomed clear and incontrovertible. I'm a thief, 
burst out Reynolds passionately, not to Tsang now, but to the world at large, a plain, common thief. And the worst of it is, there isn't a man in that San Francisco office that doesn't trust me down to the ground. Then there's the governor. Oh, God, I can't face the governor. Tsang sat immovable, lost in thought. Stray words and phrases helped but it was by some subtle working of his own complex brain that he was arriving at the truth. "'Father, him no can lend money?' he suggested presently. "'The governor? Good heavens, no. There's not enough money in our whole family to wad a gun. They put up all they had to give me a start. And look where I have landed. Do you suppose I'd go back and ask them to put up a thousand more for my rotten foolishness?' He nodded his hands together until the nails grew white. Then, seeing the unenlightened face below, he added emphatically, No, no tongue, no kanaski. How fashion you lose the money? asked Tsang. The money? Oh, belong gamble. Bet on ship's run. First day, win. Second day, win. Then lose, lose, keep on losing. Didn't know half the time what I was doing. Today my settle up. No can pay office. A thousand dollars out. Lord, all same two thousand mex. Tsang. An invisible calculation was made on the end of the steamer trunk by a long pointed fingernail, but no change of expression crossed the yellow face. For an incalculable time Tsang sat lost in thought. All his conserved energy went to aid him in solving the problem. At last he reached a decision. This was clearly a case to be laid before the only god he knew, the god of chance. Me gamble too, he said. Me no lose. But suppose you had lost. Suppose you lose what no belong you. What thing you do? You do all same my talkie you? asked Sang for the first time lifting his eyes. It was a slender straw, to be sure, but Reynolds grasped at it. What thing you mean, Tsang? What can I do? Two more night to San Francisco, said Tsang softly. One more bet, maybe. Oh, I've thought of that. What's the good of throwing good money after bad? No use. I no got chance. My have got chance, announced Tsang emphatically. You bet how fashion my talkie you... Your money come back. Reynolds studied the brass knocker of a face, but found no clue to the riddle. What do you mean, Tsang? he asked. What do you know? For the Lord's sake, don't fool with me about it. Me no fool, declared Tsang. You let me talk a number, him win big heap money. But how do you know? Me savvy, said Tsang enigmatically. Again Reynolds studied the impassive face. "'It's on the square, Tsang? You don't stand in with anybody below decks? The thing is on the level?' Then, finding further elucidation necessary, he added, "'No belong cheat.' Tsang Fu shook his head positively. "'No belong cheat, all belong plopper. No man savvy, only me savvy, this side.' And he tapped his head significantly. Reynolds gave a short, unpleasant laugh. "'All right,' he said, thrusting his hand in his pocket. "'I'll give myself one more chance. "'There'll be time tomorrow to finish my job. "'I'll make a bargain with you, Tsang. "'Bet this, and this, and this, on the next run for me. "'You win, I no make you shoot. "'You lose, you promise, bring back pistol. "'Then go away. "'My can do what thing my wanchi. See?' Song Fu looked at him cunningly. I win. You belong, good boy. Stop whiskey soda, maybe? Reynolds laughed in spite of himself. Going to reform me, oh? All right. It's a bargain. Tsang allowed his hand to be shaken. Then he carefully counted over the express checks that had been given to him. My go now, he announced as eight bells sounded from the bridge. As the door closed, Reynolds sighed. Then his eyes brightened as they fell upon the sandwiches. Even a desperate young man on the verge of suicide, if he is hungry, must needs cheer up temporarily at the sight of food. Reynolds had taken an early breakfast after being up all night 
and had eaten nothing since. After devouring the sandwiches and tea with relish, he ordered a hot bath, and in less than an hour was wrapped in his berth, sleeping the sleep that is not confined to the righteous. It was high noon the next day when he awoke. His first feeling was one of exhilaration, the long sleep, the fresh sea air pouring in at the porthole, and a sense of perfect physical well-being had made him forget, for a moment, the serious business the day might have in store for him. As he lay half-dozing, he became dimly aware that something was wrong. The throb of the engines had ceased, and an ominous stillness prevailed. He sat up in bed and listened. Then he thrust his head out of the porthole, only to see a deserted deck. The passage was likewise deserted, save for a hurried stewardess who called back over her shoulder, "'It's a man overboard, sir, on the starboard side.' Reynolds flung on his clothes. The boy in him was keen for excitement, and in five minutes he was on deck and had joined the crowd of passengers that thronged the railing. The lifeboat was being lowered, groaning and protesting as it cleared the davits and swung away from the ship's side. Far behind, in the still shining wake of the steamer, a small black object bobbed helplessly in the gray expanse of waters. "'What's the matter? Did he fall overboard? Did he jump in? Was it suicide?' The air buzzed with questions. The sentimental contingent clung to the theory that it was some poor stoker who could no longer stand the heat, or a foreign refugee afraid to come into port. The more practical argued that it was probably one of the seamen who, while doing outside painting, had lost his balance and fallen into the sea. A smug, well-dressed man with close-cropped gray beard and a detached gaze that seemed to go no further than his rimless glasses turned and spoke to Reynolds. It has gotten to be quite the fashion for somebody in the steerage to create this sort of sensation. It happened as I went over. If a man sees fit to jump overboard, all well and good. In nine cases out of ten, it's a good riddance to the community. But why, in heaven's name, should the steamer put back? Why should several hundred people be delayed an hour or so for the sake of an inconsiderate, useless fool? Reynolds turned away, sickened. From a point, apart from the rest, he strained his eyes to keep in sight the small black object, now hidden, now revealed, by the waves. A fierce sense of kinship for that man in the water seized him. He, too, perhaps, had grappled with some unendurable situation and been overcome. What if he was an utterly worthless asset on the great human ledger? He was a fellow-being, suffering, tempted, vanquished. Was it kind to bring him back? To go through with it all again? For answer, Reynolds' muscles strained with those of the sailors rowing below. All the life and youth in him rose in rebellion against unnecessary death. He watched with teeth hard set as the small boat climbed to the crest of a wave, then plunged into the trough again, crawling by imperceptible inches toward the bobbing spot in the water. He longed to be in the boat, in the water even, helping to save that human life that only on the verge of extinction had gained significance. What if the man wished to die? No matter, he must be saved, saved from himself, given another chance, made to face it out, whatever it was. Not until then did Reynolds remember another life that he had dared to threaten, that even now he meant to take if the wheel of chance swung against him. Suddenly he faced the awful judgment of his own act, and shuddered back as one who, standing upon a precipice, trembles in terror before the mad desire to leap. "'I'll stick it out,' he said half aloud as if in promise. "'Whatever comes, I'll take my medicine. I'll—' An eager murmur swept through the crowd. A sailor with a rope about him was being lowered from the lifeboat. For five tense minutes the two men rose and fell at the mercy of the high waves, and the distance between them did not lessen by an inch. Then a passenger with a binocular announced that the sailor was swimming around to the far side to get the man between him and the boat. With long, steady, overhand strokes the sailor was gaining his way, and when at last he reached the apparently motionless object and got a rope under its arms, and the two were hauled into the lifeboat, a rousing cheer went up from the big steamer above. Reynolds drew in his breath sharply and turned away from the railing. As he did so, 
he was hailed by a group of friends who were returning to their cards, waiting face downward on the small tables in the smoking-room. "'Behold his nibs!' shouted Glass, the actor, "'the luckiest duffer that ever hit a highball.' "'How did you happen to do it?' cried another. Reynolds lifted his hand to his bewildered head. "'Do what?' he asked. "'I'm not on.' "'Oh, come,' said Glass, shaking him by the shoulder. "'That bet you sent in last night. "'When the chink and you wanted to buy the low field for all six pools "'and to bet five hundred to boot that you'd win, "'I thought you were either drunk or crazy. "'Yesterday's run was four fifty-one, a regular corker, "'and yet with even better weather conditions "'you took only the numbers below four thirty-one. "'I argued with the Chinaman till I was blue in the face, "'but he stood pat, said you were all right, "'and had told him what to do. "'Nothing but an accident could have saved you, "'and it arrived. "'You've won the biggest pool of the crossing. "'Don't you think it's about time for you to set em up? "'Say martini cocktails for the crowd, eh?' "'Reynolds was jostled about in congratulation "'and good-humoured banter. "'Everybody was glad of the boy's success. "'He was an all-round favourite and some of them who had won his money felt relieved to return it. "'Here's your cocktail, Freddy,' cried Glass, "'and here's to you.' Reynolds stood in the midst of the crowd, his face flushed, his hair tumbled. With a quick movement he sent the glass and its contents spinning out of a nearby porthole. "'Not for Frederick,' he said with emphasis. "'I've been that particular kind of fool for the last time.' Some hours later, when the crowd went below to dress for dinner, Reynolds dropped behind to ask the second officer about the man who had been rescued. "'He is still pretty full of salt water,' said the officer, "'but he's being bailed out.' "'How did it happen?' asked Reynolds. "'Give it up. He hasn't spoken yet. It looks as if he were getting ready to do some outside cleaning, for he had on a life preserver. Funny thing about it, though, that's not his work. He's not even on duty during the starboard watch.' The man in the lookout saw him climb out on the bow, shout something up to him, then fall backward into the water. I'll be hanged if I can make it out. Sang Fu is one of the steadiest sailors on board. Sang Fu? shouted Reynolds. You don't mean that man was Sang? With headlong haste he seized the bewildered officer and made him pilot him below decks. Stumbling down the ladders and through dark passages, he at last reached the bunk where Tsang Fu lay with the ship's surgeon and a steward in attendance. The Chinaman's lips were drawn tightly back over his prominent teeth, and his breath came in irregular gasps. Across the pillow in a straight black line lay his dripping cue. As his eyelids fluttered feebly, the doctor straightened his own tired back. "'He'll come round now, all right.' he said to the steward. Give him those drops, and don't talk to him. He's had a close call. I'll be back in ten minutes. Reynolds crowded into the narrow space the doctor had left. The fact that he was saved from disgrace was utterly blotted out by the bigger fact that this ignorant, uncouth foreign sailor had fearlessly risked his life to save him from facing a merited punishment. Reynolds's very soul seemed to grow bigger to accommodate the thought. Tsang! he whispered, seizing the yellow hand. "'You are a brick. Number one, good man. But my no can take money. I—' The steward in attendance, who had stepped aside, made a warning gesture and laid his finger on his lips. For five minutes the man in the bunk and the one beside it looked silently into each other's eyes. Then the drawn lips moved, and Reynolds, bending his head to listen, heard the broken question. "'You—' "'No Blake bargain?' Reynolds' mind dashed at two conclusions and recoiled from each. Should he follow his impulse to explain the whole affair, serious consequences would result for Tsang, while the other alternative of accepting the situation made him a party, albeit an innocent one, to a most reprehensible proceeding. It was to his credit that of the two courses the latter was infinitely the more intolerable. He got up nervously, then sat down again. "'No black bargain,' repeated Sang anxiously. Still, Reynolds waited for some prompting from a conscience unaccustomed to being rusty. Any course that would involve the loyal little Chinaman, who had played the game according to the rules as he knew them, was out of the question. 
The money must be paid back, of course, but how and when? If he cleared himself at the office, it might be years before he could settle this new debt. But he could do it in time. He must do it. Then at last, light came to him. He would accept Sang's sacrifice, but it should stand for more than the mere material good it had purchased. It should pledge him to a fresh start, a clean life. He would justify the present by the future. He drew a deep breath of relief and leaned forward. Tsang, he said, and his voice trembled with the earnestness of his resolve. I no break bargain. From now on, my behave all seem proper. It wasn't right, old fellow. You oughtn't. Then he gave it up and smiled helplessly. You belong, my good friend, Tsang. What thing you want ye? A slow smile broke the brass-like stillness of Tsang Fu's face. Pipe, he gasped softly. Opium, very good. Make land and sea all same by and by. End of A Matter of Friendship Section number six of Miss Mink's Soldier and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becca Young. Miss Mink's Soldier and Other Stories by Alice Hegan Rice. The Wild Oats of a Spinster. Judging from appearances, Miss Lucinda Perkins was justifying her reason for being by conforming absolutely to her environment. She apparently fitted as perfectly into her little niche in the Locustwood Seminary for Young Ladies as Miss Jo Hill fitted into hers. The only difference was that Miss Jo Hill did not confine herself to a niche. She filled the seminary, as a plump hand does a tight glove. It was the year after Miss Lucinda had come to the seminary to teach elocution that Miss Jo Hill discovered in her an affinity. As principal, Miss Jo Hill's word was never questioned, and Miss Lucinda, with pleased obedience, accepted the honor that was thrust upon her, and meekly moved her few belongings into Miss Jo Hill's apartment. For four years they had lived in the rarefied atmosphere of celestial friendship. They clothed their bodies in the same raiment, and their minds in the same thoughts, and when one was cold, the other shivered. If Miss Lucinda, in those early days, found it difficult to live up to Miss Jo Hill's transcendental code, she gave no sign of it. She laid aside her mildly adorned garments and enveloped her small, angular person in a garb of somber severity. Even the modest bird that adorned her hat was replaced by an uncompromising band. She forswore meat and became a vegetarian. She stopped reading novels and devoted her spare time to essays and biography. In fact, she and Miss Jo Hill became one, and that one was Miss Jo Hill. It was not until Floss Beckert entered the senior class at Locustwood Seminary that this sublimated friendship suffered a jar. Floss's father lived in Chicago, and it was due to his unerring discernment in the buying and selling of livestock that Floss was being finished in all branches without regard to the cost. "'Learn her all you want to,' he said magnanimously to Miss Lucinda, who negotiated the arrangement. "'I ain't got but two children, her and Tom.' He's just like me, don't know a blame thing but business, but Floss... His bosom swelled under his checked vest. She's on to it all. I pay for everything you get into her head. Dancing, singing, French, all them extries goes. Miss Lucinda had consequently undertaken the management of Floss Speckert, and the result had been far-reaching in its consequences. Floss was a person whose thoughts did not dwell upon the highest development of the spiritual life. Her mind was given over to the pursuit of worldly amusements, her only serious thought being a burning ambition to win histrionic honors. The road to this led naturally through the elocution classes, and Floss accepted Miss Lucinda as the only means toward the desired end. A drop of water in a bottle of ink produces no visible result, but a drop of ink in a glass of water contaminates it at once. Miss Lucinda took increasing interest in her frivolous young pupil, she listened with half-suppressed eagerness to unlimited gossip about stageland, and even sank to the regular perusal of certain bold theatrical papers. 
she was unmistakably becoming contaminated. Meanwhile, Miss Jo Hill, quite blind to the situation, condoned the friendship. You are developing your own character, she told Miss Lucinda. You are exercising self-control and forbearance in dealing with that crude, undisciplined girl. Florence is the natural outcome of common stock and newly acquired riches. It is your noble aspiration to take this vulgar clay and mould it into something higher. Your motive is laudable, Lucinda. Your self-sacrifice in giving up our evening hour together is heroic. I read you like an open book, dear. And Miss Lucinda listened and trembled. They were standing together before the window of their rigid little sitting-room, the chastened severity of which banished all ideas of comfort. "'What purpose do you serve?' Miss Jo Hill demanded of every article that went into her apartment, and many of the comforts of life failed to pass the examination. After Miss Jo Hill had gone out, Miss Lucinda remained at the window and restlessly tapped her knuckles against the sill. The insidious spring sunshine, the laughter of the girls in the court below— the foolish happy birds telling their secrets under the new green leaves all worked together to disturb her peace of mind. She resolutely turned her back to the window and took breathing exercises. That was one of Miss Jo Hill's sternest requirements. Fifteen minutes three times a day and two pints of water between meals. Then she sat down in a straight-back chair and tried to read, the power through poise. Her body was doing its duty, but it did not deceive her mind. She knew that she was living a life of black deception. Evidences of her guilt were on every hand. Behind the books on her little shelf was a paper of chocolate creams. In the music rack, back to back with Grieg and Brahms, was an impertinent sheet of ragtime which Floss had persuaded her to learn as an accompaniment. And deeper and darker and falser than all was a plan which had been fermenting in her mind for days. In a fortnight the school term would be over. Following the usual custom, Miss Lucinda was to go to her brother in the country, and Miss Jo Hill to her sister for a week. This obligation to their respective families being discharged, they would repair to the seclusion of a Catskill farmhouse, there to hang upon each other's souls for the rest of the summer. Miss Lucinda's visits to her brother were reminiscent of a multiplicity of children and a scarcity of room. To her, the inferno presented no more disquieting prospect than the necessity of sharing her bedroom. She always returned from these sojourns in the country with impaired digestion and shattered nerves. She looked forward to them with dread, and looked back on them with horror. Was it any wonder that when a brilliant alternative presented itself, she was eager to accept it? Floss Speckert had gained her father's consent to spend her first week out of school in New York, provided she could find a suitable chaperone. She had fallen upon the first and most harmless person in sight and besieged her with entreaties. Miss Lucinda would have flared to the project had not a forbidding presence loomed between her and the alluring invitation. She knew only too well that Miss Jo Hill would never countenance the proposition. As she was trying vainly to concentrate on her power through poise, she was startled by a noise at the window, followed immediately by a disheveled figure that scrambled laughingly over the sill. "'I came down the fire escape!' whispered the invader breathlessly. Miss Jo Hill caught us making fudge in the linen closet. I gave her the slip. But Florence, Miss Lucinda began reproachfully, but Floss interrupted her. Don't Florence me, Miss Lucy. You are pretending to be mad anyhow. You are a perfect darling and Miss Jo Hill is an old bear. Miss Lucinda was aghast at this irreverence, but her halting protest had no effect on the torrent of Floss's eloquence. I am going to take you to New York the girl declared, and I am going to give you the time of your life. Dad's got to put us up in style, a room and a bath apiece and maybe a sitting room. He likes me to splurge around a bit, says he'd hate to have a daughter that acted like she wasn't used to money. Miss Lucinda glanced apprehensively at the door, and then back at the sparkling face before her. I can't go, she insisted miserably, trying to free her hand from Floss's plump grasp. My brother is expecting me and Miss Hill. Oh, bother Miss Jo Hill! You don't have to tell her anything about it. You can pretend you are going to your brother's and meet me someplace on the road instead. Miss Lucinda looked horrified, but she listened. A material kept plastic by years of manipulation does not harden to a new hand. Her objections to Floss's plan grew fainter and fainter. Think of the theaters, went on the temptress, putting an arm around her neck and ignoring the fact that caresses embarrassed Miss Lucinda almost to the point of tears. Think of it! A new show every night, and operas and pictures! 
there will be three shakespeare plays that week merchant of venice twelfth night and hamlet miss lucinda's heart fluttered in her bosom although she had spent a great part of her life interpreting the bard of avon she had never seen one of his plays produced in her secret soul she believed that her own rendition of the quality of mercy was not to be excelled i, I haven't any clothes she urged feebly putting up her last defence i have declared floss in triumph two trunks full and we are almost the same size it's just for a week miss lucy won't you come miss lucinda sitting rigid felt a warm cheek pressed against her own and a stray curl touched her lips she sat for a moment with her eyes closed it was more than disconcerting to be so close to youth and joy in life it was infectious the blood surged suddenly through her veins and an exultation seized her i'm going to do it she cried recklessly i never had a real good time in my life floss threw her arms about her and waltzed her across the room but a step in the hall brought them to a halt it's miss joe hill whispered floss with trepidation i am going out the way i came don't forget you have promised when miss joe hill entered she smiled complacently at finding miss lucinda in the straight-backed chair absorbed in the second volume of the power through poise at the union depot in chicago two weeks later a small nervous lady fluttered uncertainly from one door to another she wore a short brown coat suit of classic severity and a felt hat which was fastened under her smoothly braided hair by a narrow elastic band on her fourth trip to the main entrance she stopped a train boy can you tell me where i can get a drink she asked fanning her flushed face he looked surprised third door to the left he answered miss lucinda carrying a handbag a suitcase and an umbrella followed directions when she pushed open the heavy door she was confronted by a long counter with shining glasses and a smiling bartender beating a confused retreat she fled back to the main entrance and stood there trembling for the hundredth time that day she wished she had not come the arrangements so glibly planned by floss had not been adhered to in any particular at the last moment that mercurial young person had decided to go on two days in advance and visit a friend in philadelphia she wrote miss lucinda to come on to chicago where tom would meet her and give her her ticket and she would meet her in new york with many misgivings and grievous twinges of conscience miss lucinda had bade miss joe hill a guilty farewell and started ostensibly for her brother's home at the junction she changed cars for chicago missed two connections and lost her lunch box now that she had arrived in chicago three hours late nervous and excited over her experiences there was no one to meet her a sense of homesickness rushed over her and she decided to return to locustwood it was the same motive that might prompt a newly hatched chicken embarrassed by its sudden liberty to return to its shell just as she was going in search of a timetable a round-faced young man came up miss perkins he asked and when she nodded he went on been looking for you for a half an hour sis told me what you look like but i couldn't find you he failed to observe that floss's comparison had been a squirrel isn't it nearly time to start asked miss lucinda nervously just five minutes but i wanted to explain something to you first he looked through the papers in his pocket and selected one this is a pass he explained the governor can get them over this road i got there late so i could only get one that had been made out for somebody else and not been used it's all right you know you won't have a bit of trouble miss lucinda took the bit of paper put on her glasses and read mrs lura doring yes said tom that's the lady it was made out for nine chances out of ten they won't mention it but if anything comes up you just say yes you are mrs doring and it will be all right but protested miss lucinda ready to weep i cannot tell a falsehood i don't think you'll have to said tom somewhat impatiently but if you deny it you'll get us both in no end of a scrape hello there's the call for your train i'll bring your bag in the confusion of getting settled in her section and of expressing her gratitude to tom miss lucinda forgot for the time the deadly weight of guilt that rested upon her it was not until the conductor called for her ticket that her heart grew cold and a look of consternation swept over her face it seemed to her that he eyed the pass suspiciously and when he did not return it a terror seized her she knew he was coming back to ask her name and what was her name mrs dora luring or mrs dora loring or mrs lura doring in despair she fled to the dressing-room and stood there concealed by the curtains in a few moments the conductor passed and she peeped at his retreating figure he stopped in the narrow passage by the window and studied her pass 
Then he compared it with a telegram which he held in his hand. Just then the porter joined him, and she flattened herself against the wall and held her breath. It's the same name, she heard the conductor say in an undertone. I'll wire back to headquarters at the next stop. If ever retribution followed an erring soul, it followed Miss Lucinda on that trip. No one spoke to her, and nothing happened, but she sat in terrified suspense, looking neither right nor left, her heart beating frantically at every approach, and the whirring wheels repeated the questioning refrain, Dora Luring, Dora Loring, Laura Doring. In New York, Floss met her as she stepped off the train, fairly enveloping her in her enthusiasm. "'Here you are, you old darling. I've been having a fit of a minute for fear you wouldn't come. This is my cousin May. She's going to stay with us the whole week. New York is simply heavenly, Miss Lucy. We have made four engagements already. Matinee this afternoon. A dinner tonight. What's the matter? Did you leave anything on the train?' "'No. No,' stammered Miss Lucinda, still casting furtive glances backward at the conductor. "'Was he talking to a policeman?' she asked suspiciously. "'Who?' The conductor. The girls laughed. I don't wonder you were scared, said Floss. A policeman always does remind me of Miss Joe Hill. They called a cab, and to Miss Lucinda's vast relief were soon rolling away from the scene of danger. It needed only one glance into a handsome suite of an uptown hotel one week later to prove the rapid moral deterioration of the prodigal. Arrayed in a shell pink kimono, she was having her nails manicured. Her gaily figured garment was sufficient in itself to give her an unusual appearance, but there was a more startling reason. Miss Lucinda's hair, hitherto a pale drab smoothly drawn into a braided coil at the back, had undergone a startling metamorphosis. It was Floss's suggestion that Miss Lucinda wash it in golden glow, a preparation guaranteed to restore luster and beauty to faded locks. Miss Lucinda had been overzealous, and the result was that of a copper in sunshine. These outward manifestations, however, were insignificant compared with the evidences of Miss Lucinda's inner guilt. She was taking the keenest interest in the manicure's progress, only lifting her eyes occasionally to survey herself with satisfaction in the mirror opposite. At first, her sense of propriety had been deeply offended by her changed appearance. She wept so bitterly that the girls, seeking to console her, had overdone the matter. "'I never thought you could look so pretty,' Floss had declared. You look ten years younger. It makes your eyes brighter and your skin clearer. Of course this awfully bright color will wear off, and then it will be just dear. Miss Lucinda began to feel better. She even allowed May to arrange her changed locks in a modest pompadour. The week she had spent in New York was a riotous round of dissipation. May's fiancé had prepared a whirlwind of pleasures, and Miss Lucinda was caught up and revolved at a pace that made her dizzy. Dances, dinners, plays, roof gardens, coaching parties were all held together by a line of candy, telegrams, and roses. There was only one time in the day when Miss Lucinda came down to earth. Every evening, no matter how exhausted she might be from the frivolities of the day, she conscientiously penned an affectionate letter to her celestial affinity, expressing her undying devotion and incidentally mentioning the health and doings of her brother's family. These she sent under separate cover to her brother to be mailed. Her conscience assured her that the reckoning would come, that sooner or later she would face the bar of justice and receive the verdict of guilty. But while one day of grace remained, she would still, in the fire of spring, her winter garments of repentance fling. As the manicure put the finishing touches to her nails, Floss came rushing in. "'Hurry up, Miss Lucy, dear. Dick Benson's just phoned that he is going to take us for a farewell frolic. We leave here at five, have dinner somewhere, then do all sorts of stunts. You're going to wear my tan coat suit and light blue waist. Yes, you are, too. That's all foolishness. Everybody wears elbow sleeves. Blue's your color, and I've got the hat to match. May says she'll fix your hair, and you can wear her French heel Oxfords again. They pitch you over. Oh, nonsense. You just tripped along the other day like a nice little jaybird. Hurry, hurry! Even Miss Lucinda's week of strenuous living had not prepared her for what followed. First, there was a short trip on the train, during which she conscientiously studied a map. Then followed a dinner at a large and ostentatious hotel. The decorations were more brilliant, the music louder, and the dresses gayer than any place Miss Lucinda had yet been. She viewed the passing show through her glasses and experienced a pleasant thrill of sophistication. This, she assured herself, was society. Henceforth, she was in a position to rail at its follies as one having authority. In the midst of these complacent reflections, she choked on a crumb and after groping with closed eyes for her tumbler, gulped down the contents. 
A strange, delicious tingle filled her mouth. She forgot she was choking and opened her eyes. To her horror, she found that she had emptied her glass of champagne. Spiritous liquor, she thought in dismay as the shade of Miss Joe Hill rose before her. Total abstinence was such a firm plank in the platform of the celestial affinity that, even in the chafing dish, alcohol had been tabooed. The utter iniquity of having deliberately swallowed a glass of champagne was appalling to Miss Lucinda. She sat silent during the rest of the dinner, eating little and plucking nervously at the ruffles about her elbows. The fear of rheumatism in her wrist which had assailed her earlier in the evening gave way to a deeper and more disturbing discomfort. When the dinner was over, the party started forth on a hilarious round of sightseeing. Miss Lucinda limped after them, vaguely aware that she was in a giant electric cage filled with swarming humanity, that bands were playing, drums beating, and that every turn disagreeable men with loud voices were employing her to step this way. Come on, cried Derek. We are going on the scenic railway. But the worm turned. I, I am not going, she protested. I will wait here. All of you go. I will wait right here. With a sigh of relief, she slipped into a vacant corner and gave herself up to the luxury of being miserable. She longed for solitude in which to face the full enormity of her misdeed and to plan an immediate reformation. She would throw herself bodily upon the mercy of Miss Joe Hill. She would spare herself nothing. Penance of any kind would be welcome. Bodily pain, even. She shifted her weight to the slender support of one high-heeled shoe while she rested the other foot. Her hair, unused to its new arrangement, pulled cruelly upon every restraining hairpin, and her head was beginning to ache. I deny the slavery of sense. I repudiate the bondage of matter. I affirm spirit and freedom, she quoted to herself, but the thought failed to have any effect. A two-ringed circus was in progress at her right, while at her left a procession of camels and Egyptians was followed by a noisy crowd of urchins. People were thronging in every direction, and she realized that she was occasionally the recipient of a curious glance. She began to watch rather anxiously for the return of her party. Ten minutes passed, and still they did not come. Suddenly, the awful possibility presented itself that they might have lost her. She had no money, and even with it she knew she could not find her way back to the hotel alone. Anxiety gained upon her in leaps. In bitter remorse she upbraided herself for ever having strayed from the blessed protection of Miss Joe Hill's authority. Gulfs of hideous possibility yawned at her feet. Imagination faltered at the things that might befall a lone and unprotected lady in this bedlam of frivolity. Just as her fear was turning to terror, the party returned. "'Oh, here you are!' cried Floss. "'We thought we had lost you.' It was just dandy, Miss Lucy. You ought to have gone. It makes you feel like your feet are growing right out the top of your head. Come on, we are going to have our tintypes taken. Strengthened by the fear of being alone again, Miss Lucinda rallied her courage and once more followed in their wake. She was faint and exhausted, but the one grain of comfort she extracted from the situation was that through her present suffering, she was atoning for her sins. At midnight, Dick said, There's only one other thing to do. It's more fun than all the rest put together. Come this way. Miss Lucinda followed blindly. She had ceased to think. There were only two realities left in the world, French heels and hairpins. At the foot of a flight of steps, the party paused to buy tickets. You can wait for us here, Miss Lucy, said Floss. Miss Lucinda protested eagerly that she was not too tired to go with them. The prospect of being left alone again nerved her to climb any height. But, cried Floss, if you get up there, there's only one way to come down. You have to— Let her come! interrupted the others in a laughing chorus, and to Miss Lucinda's great relief, she was allowed to pass through the little gate. When she reached the top of the long stair, she looked about for the attraction. A wide, inclined plane slanted down to the ground floor, and on it were bumps of various sizes and shapes, all of a shining smoothness. She had a vague idea that it was a mammoth map for the blind, until she saw Dick and Floss sit down at the top and go sliding to the bottom. "'Come on, Miss Lucinda!' cried May. "'You can't get down any other way, you know. Look out! Here I go!' One by one the others followed, and Miss Lucinda could not distinguish them as they merged in the laughing crowd at the base. Delay was fatal. They would lose her again if she hesitated. In desperation, she gathered her skirts about her and let herself cautiously down on the floor. For one awful moment, terror paralyzed her. Then, 
Grasping her skirts with one hand and her hat with the other and closing her eyes, she slid. Miss Lucinda did not hump the bumps. She slid gracefully around them, describing fanciful curves and loops in her airy flight. When she arrived in a confused bunch on the cushioned platform below, she was greeted with a burst of applause. "'Ain't it great?' cried Floss, straightening Miss Lucinda's hat and trying to get her to open her eyes. "'Dick says you are the gamest chaperone he ever saw. Sit up and let me pin your collar straight.' But Miss Lucinda's sense of direction had evidently been disturbed, for she did not yet know which way was up and which was down. She leaned limply against Floss and tried to catch her breath. "'Excuse me,' said a man's voice above her. "'But are either of you ladies Miss Lura Doring?' The effect was electrical. Miss Lucinda sat bolt upright and stared madly about. Tom Speckert had told her to be sure to answer to that name. It would get him into trouble if she failed to do so. "'Yes, yes,' she gasped. "'I am Miss Lura Doring.' The members of her little party looked at her anxiously and ceased to laugh. The slide had evidently unsettled her mind. "'Why, this is Miss Perkins, Miss Lucinda Perkins of Locustwood, Ohio,' explained Dick Benson to the officer. "'She's rather upset by our tobogganing and didn't understand you.' "'I did,' declared Miss Lucinda, making mysterious signs to Dick to be silent. "'It's all right. I am Mrs. Doring.' The officer looked suspiciously from one to the other, then consulted his memorandum. Small, slender woman, yellow hair, gray eyes, answers to the name of Miss Lura Doring, left Chicago on June 10. "'When did you get to New York?' asked the officer. "'A week ago tomorrow, on the 11th,' said Floss. "'Then I guess I'll have to take her up,' said the officer. "'She answers all the requirements. I've got a warrant for her arrest.' Arrest! gasped Benson. What for? For forging her husband's name and defrauding two hotels in Chicago. My husband? Miss Lucinda staggered to her feet. Then, catching sight of the crowd that had collected, she gave a fluttering cry and fainted away in the arms of the law. When Miss Joe Hill arrived in New York in answer to an urgent telegram, she went directly to work with her usual executive ability to unravel the mystery. After obtaining the full facts in the case, she was able to make a satisfactory explanation to the officers at headquarters. Then she sent the girls to their respective homes, and turned her full attention upon Miss Lucinda. "'The barber will be here in half an hour to cut your hair,' she announced on the eve of their departure for the Catskills. "'You ought not be so good to me,' sobbed Miss Lucinda, who was lying limply on a couch. Miss Jo Hill took her hand firmly and said, "Lucinda." Error and illness and disorder are man-made perversions. Let the past week be wiped from our memories. Once we are in the mountains, we will turn the formative power of our thoughts upon things invisible and yield ourselves to the higher harmonies. The next morning, Miss Lucinda, shorn and penitent, was led forth from the scene of her recent profligacy. It was her final exit from a world which, for a little space, she had loved not wisely, but too well. End of section six. Recording by Becca Young. Section seven of Miss Mink's Soldier and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gretchen Laboon, Columbus, www.suchavoice.com backslash spoken word miss mink's soldier and other stories by alice hegan rice cupid goes slumming it is a debatable question whether love is a cause or an effect whether adam discovered a heart in the recesses of his anatomy before or after the appearance of eve in the case of joe ritter it was distinctly the former at nineteen his knowledge of the tender passion consisted of dynamic impressions received across the footlights at an angle of forty-five degrees. Love was something that hovered with the calcium light about beauty in distress, something that brought the hero from the uttermost parts of the earth to hurl defiance at the villain and clasp the swooning maiden in his arms. It was something that sent a fellow down from his perch in the peanut gallery with his head hot and his hands cold and a sort of blissful misery rioting in his soul. 
Joe lived in what was known by courtesy as Rear Ninth Street. Rear Ninth Street has a sound of exclusive aristocracy, and the name was a matter of some pride to the dwellers in the narrow, unpaved alley that rides its watery way between two rows of tumble-down cottages. Joe's family consisted of his father, whose vocation was plumbing and whose avocation was driving either in the ambulance or the patrol wagon. His mother, who had discharged her entire debt to society when she bestowed nine healthy young citizens upon it, eight young Ritters, and Joe himself, who had stopped school at twelve to assume the financial responsibilities of a rapidly increasing family. Lack of time and the limited opportunities of Rear Ninth Street, together with an uncontrollable shyness, had brought Joe to his nineteenth year of broad-shouldered, muscular manhood with no acquaintance whatever among the girls. But where a shrine is built for Cupid and the tapers are kept burning, the devotee is seldom disappointed. One morning in October, as Joe was guiding his rickety wheel around the mud puddles on his way to the cooper shops, he saw a new sign on the first cottage after he left the alley. Mrs. R. Beaver, modiste and dressmaker. In the yard and on the steps were a confusion of household effects, and in their midst, a girl with a pink shawl over her head. So absorbed was Joe in open-mouthed wonder over the modiste that he failed to see the girl until a laughing exclamation made him look up. Watch out! "'What's the matter?' asked Joe, coming to a halt. "'I thought maybe you didn't know your wheels was going round,' the girl said audaciously, and then fled into the house and slammed the door. All day at the shops Joe worked as in a trance. Every iron rivet that he drove into a wooden hoop was duly informed of the romantic occurrence of the morning. And as some four thousand rivets are fastened into four thousand hoops in the course of one day, it will be seen that the matter was duly considered.' The stray spark from a feminine eye had kindled such a fierce fire in his heart that by the time the six o'clock whistle blew, the conflagration grew a rosy glow over the entire landscape. As he rode home, the girl was sitting on the steps, but she would not look at him. Joe had formulated a definite course of action, and though the utter boldness of it nearly cost him his balance, he adhered to it strictly. When just opposite her gate, without turning his head or his eyes, he lifted his hat, then rode at a furious pace round the corner. "'What are you tidying up for, so, Joe?' asked his mother that night. "'You going out?' "'No,' said Joe evasively, as he endeavored in vain to coax back the shine to an old pair of shoes. "'Well, I'm right glad you ain't. Bernie and Dick ain't got up the coal, and there's all them dishes to wash, and the baby she's got a misery in her year.' "'Has Pa turned up?' asked Joe." Yes, answered Mrs. Ritter indifferently. He looked in about three o'clock. He was tolerable full then, and I expect he's been took up by now. He said he was a gonna buy me a bird cage with a bird in it. But I surely hope he won't. Them white mice he brought me on his last spree chewed a hole in Bernie's stocking. Besides, I never did care much for birds. Good lands, what are you gonna wash your head for? Joe was substituting a basin of water for a small girl in the nearest kitchen chair, and a howl ensued. "'Shut up, Lottie,' admonished Mrs. Ritter. "'You ain't any too good to sit on the floor.' "'It's a good thing this is payday, Joe, for the rent's due, and four of the children's got their feet on the ground. You paid up the grocery last week, didn't you?' Joe nodded a dripping head. "'Well, I'll just get your money out of your coat while I think about it. She went on as she rummaged in his pocket and brought out nine dollars. "'Leave me a quarter,' demanded Joe, gasping beneath his soap suds. "'All right,' said Mrs. Ritter accommodatingly. "'Now that Bob and Ike are getting fifty cents a day, it ain't so hard to make out. I'll be getting a new dress first thing, you know.' "'I seen one up at the corner,' said Joe. "'A new dress?' "'Nah, a dressmaker. She's got out her sign. "'What's her name?' asked Mrs. Ritter, keen with interest. "'Mrs. R. Beaver, modiste,' repeated Joe from the sign that floated in letters of gold in his memory. "'I knowed a Mrs. Beaver once, up on 11th Street, a big fat woman that got in a fuss with the preacher and smacked his jaws.' "'Did she have any children?' asked Joe. "'Seems like there was one, a pretty little tow-headed girl.' "'That's her,' announced Joe conclusively. What was her name? 
Lawsy, I don't know. I never would have recollected Mrs. Beaver, except she was such a tarnacious woman, always a tearing up stumps and never happy unless she was a ripetin about something. What you want? A needle and thread to mend your coat? Why, what struck you? You've been wearing it that way for a month. You better leave it be till I get time to fix it. But Joe had determined to work out the salvation of his own wardrobe. Late in the evening, after the family had retired, he sat before the stove with back humped and knees drawn up, trying to coax a coarse thread through a small needle. Surely no rich man need have fear about entering the kingdom of heaven since Joe Ritter managed to get that particular thread through the eye of that particular needle. But when a boy is put at a workbench at twelve years of age and does the same thing, day in and day out for seven long years, he may have lost all the things that youth holds dear, but one thing he is apt to have learned— a dogged, plodding, unquestioning patience that shoves silently along at the appointed task until the work is done. By midnight all the rents were mended and a large new patch adorned each elbow. The patches, to be sure, were blue and the coat was black, but the stitches were set with mechanical regularity. Joe straightened his aching shoulders and held the garment at arm's length with a smile. It was his first votive offering at the Shrine of Love. The effect of Joe's efforts were prompt and satisfactory. The next day, being Sunday, he spent the major part of it in passing and repassing the house on the corner, only going home between times to remove the mud from his shoes and give an extra brush to his hair. The girl, meanwhile, was devoting her day to sweeping off the front pavement, a scant three feet of pathway from her steps to the wooden gate. Every time Joe passed, she looked up and smiled, and every time she smiled... Joe suffered all the symptoms of locomotor ataxia. By afternoon, his emotional state had reached the saturation point. Without any conscious volition on his part, his feet carried him to the gate and refused to carry him farther. His voice then decided to speak for itself, and in strange, hollow tones he heard himself saying, "'Say, do you want her to go to the show with me?' "'Sure,' said the pink fascinator. "'When?' "'I don't care,' said Joe." too much embarrassed to remember the days of the week. "'Tomorrow night?' prompted the girl. "'I don't care,' said Joe, and the conversation seeming to languish, he moved on. After countless eons of time, the next night arrived. It found Joe and his girl cozily squeezed in between two fat women in the gallery of the People's Theater. Joe had to sit sideways and double his feet up, but he would willingly have endured a rack of torture for the privilege of looking down on that fluffy, blonde pompadour under its large bow, and of receiving the sparkling glances that were flashed up at him from time to time. "'I ain't ever gone with a feller I didn't know his name before,' she confided before the curtain rose. "'It's Joe,' he said. "'Joe Ritter. What's your front name?' "'Miss Beaver,' she said mischievously. "'What do you think it is?' Joe could not guess. "'Say,' she went on. I knew who you was all right, even if I didn't know your name. I seen you over to the hall when they had that boxing match. The last one? Yes, when you and Ben Shank was fighting. Say, didn't you do a thing to him? The surest of all antidotes to masculine shyness was not without its immediate effect. Joe straightened his shoulders and smiled complacently. Didn't I massacre him? He said. That there was a half Nelson Holt I'd give him. It put him out of business, all right, all right. Say, I never knowed you was there. You bet I was, said his companion in honest admiration. That was when I got stuck on you. Before he could fully comprehend the significance of this confession, the curtain rose and love itself had to make way for the tragic and absorbing career of the widowed bride. By the end of the third act, Joe's emotions were so wrought upon by the unhappy fate of the heroine that he rose abruptly and, muttering something about getting some gum, fled to the rear. When he returned and squeezed his way back to his seat, he found Miss Beaver with red eyes and a dejected mien. "'What's the matter with you?' he asked banteringly. "'My shoe hurts me,' said Miss Beaver evasively. "'What you giving me?' asked Joe, with fine superiority. "'These here kinds of play never hurts my feelings none. Catch me crying at a show.' But Miss Beaver was much too moved to recover herself at once, she sat in limp dejection and surreptitiously dabbed her eyes with her moist ball of handkerchief. Joe was at a loss to know how to meet the situation until his hand, quite by chance, touched hers as it lay on the arm of the chair. 
He withdrew it as quickly as if he had received an electric shock, but the next moment, like a lodestone following a magnet, it traveled slowly back to hers. From that time on, Joe sat staring straight ahead of him in embarrassed ecstasy, while Miss Beaver, thus comforted, was able to pass through the tragic finale of the last act with remarkable composure. When the time came to say goodnight at the Beaver's door, all Joe's reticence and awkwardness returned. He watched her let herself in and waited until she lit a candle. Then he found himself out on the pavement in the dark, feeling as if the curtain had gone down on the best show he had ever seen. Suddenly a side window was raised cautiously, and he heard his name called softly. He had turned the corner, but he went back to the fence. "'Say,' whispered the voice at the window, "'I forgot to tell you. It's Mitty.' The course of true love thus auspiciously started might have flowed on to blissful fulfillment had it not encountered the inevitable barrier in the formidable person of Mrs. Beaver. Not that she disapproved of Mitty receiving attention. On the contrary, it was her oft-repeated boast that Mitty had been keeping company with the boys ever since she was six, and she expected she'd keep right on till she was sixty. It was not the attention in the abstract that she objected to, it was rather the threatening of a steady, and that steady the big, awkward, shy Joe Ritter. With serpentine wisdom she instituted a counter-attraction. Under her skillful manipulation, Ben Shank, the son of the saloon-keeper, soon developed into a rival suitor. Ben was engaged at a downtown pool room and wore collars on a weekday without any apparent discomfort. The style of his garments, together with his easy air of sophistication, entirely captivated Mrs. Beaver, while Ben, on his part, found it increasingly pleasant to lounge in the Beaver's best parlor chair and recount to a credulous audience the prominent part which he was taking in all the affairs of the day. Matters reached a climax one night when, after some close financing, Joe Ritter took Mitty to the skating rink. An unexpected run on the ten savings bank at the Ritter's had caused a temporary embarrassment and by the closest calculation Joe could do no better than pay for two entrance tickets and hire one pair of skates. He therefore found it necessary to develop a sprained ankle which grew rapidly worse as they neared the rink. "'I don't think you order skate on it, Joe,' said Mitty sympathetically. "'Oh, I reckon I can manage it okay,' said Joe. "'But I ain't a-gonna let you,' she declared with divine authority. "'We can just set down and rubber at the rest of them.' "'No, you don't,' said Joe. "'You can go on and skate, and I'll watch you.' The arrangement proved entirely satisfactory so long as Mitty paused on every other round to rest or to get him to adjust a strap or to hold her hat. But when Ben Shank arrived on the scene, the situation was materially changed. It was sufficiently irritating to see Ben go through an exhaustive exhibition of his accomplishments under the admiring glances of Mitty, but when he condescended to ask her to skate and even offered to teach her some new figures, Joe's irritation rose to ire. In vain he tried to catch her eye. She was laughing and clinging to Ben and giving all her attention to his instructions. Joe sat sullen and indignant, savagely biting his nails. He would have parted with everything he had in the world at that moment for three paltry nickels. On and on went the skaters and on and on went the music, and Joe turned his face to the wall and doggedly waited. When at last Mitty came to him flushed and radiant, he had no word of greeting for her. "'Did you see all the new steps Mr. Ben learnt me?' she asked. "No," nah, said Joe. "'Does your foot hurt you, Joe?' "No," nah, said Joe. Mitty was too versed in masculine moods to press the subject. She waited until they were out under the starlight in the clear stretch of common near home. Then she slipped her hand through his arm and said coaxingly, "'Say now, Joe, what you kicking bout?' "'Him,' said Joe comprehensively. "'Mr. Ben? Why, he's one of our best friends. Ma likes him better than anybody I ever kept company with. What have you all fellers got against him?' "'He was black-marbled at the hall, all right,' said Joe grimly. "'What for?' "'It ain't none of my business to tell what for,' said Joe, though his lips ached to tell what he knew." Ma says all you fellows are jealous cause he talks so pretty and wears such stylish clothes. We might too if we got him like he done, Joe began, then checked himself. Say, Mitty, why don't your ma like me? She says you haven't got any school education and don't talk good grammar. Don't I talk good grammar? 
asked Joe anxiously. I don't know, said Mitty. That's what she says. How long did you go to school? Me? Oh, off and on about two year. The old man was always poorly, and Ma, she had to work out till me and the boys done got big enough to work. For that I had to stay home and mind the kids. Don't I talk like other fellas, Mitty? You talk better than some, said Mitty loyally. After he left her, Joe reviewed the matter carefully. He thought of the few educated people he knew, the boss at the shops, the preacher up on 12th Street, the doctor who sewed up his head after he'd stopped a runaway team, even Ben Shank, who had gone through the eighth grade. Yes, there was a difference. Being clean and wearing good clothes were not the only things. When he got home, he tiptoed into the front room and, picking his way around the various beds and pallets, took Bernie's school satchel from the top of the wardrobe. Retracing his steps, he returned to the kitchen, and with his hat still on and his coat collar turned up, he began to take an inventory of his mental stock. One after another of the dog-eared, grimy books he pondered over, and one after another he laid aside with a puzzled, distressed look deepening in his face. "'Bernie, she ain't but fourteen, and she gets on to him,' he said to himself. "'Looks like I order.' Once more he seized the nearest book, and with the courage of despair, repeated the sentences again and again to himself. "'That you, Joe?' asked Mrs. Ritter from the next room an hour later. "'I didn't know you'd come. Your pa sent word by old man Jackson that he was at Hank's Exchange, way down on Market Street, and for you to come get him.' "'It's twelve o'clock,' remonstrated Joe. "'I know it,' said Mrs. Ritter, yawning. But I reckon you better go. The old man always gets the rheumatiz when he lays out all night, and that there rheumatiz medicine costs sixty-five cents a bottle. All right, said Joe, with a resignation born of experience. But don't you go and put no more of the kids in my bed. Jack and Gus kick the stuffing out of me now. And with this parting injunction, he went wearily out into the night, giving up his struggle with Minerva, only to begin the next round with Bacchus. The seeds of ambition, though sown late, grew steadily, and Joe became so desirous of proving worthy of the consideration of Mrs. Beaver that he took the boss of the shops partially into his confidence. "'It's a first-rate idea, Joe,' said the boss, a big, capable fellow who had worked his way up from the bottom. "'I could move you right along the line if you had a better education. I have a good offer up in Chicago next year. If you can get more book sense in your head, I will take you along.' "'Where can I get it at?' asked Joe, somewhat dubious of his own power of achievement. "'Night school,' said the boss. "'I know a man that teaches in the settlement over on Burke Street. "'I'll put you in there if you like.' Now the prospect of going to school to a man who had been head of a family for seven years, who had been the champion scrapper of the South End, and who was in the midst of a critical love affair, trebly humiliating. But Joe was game, and while he determined to keep the matter as secret as possible, he agreed to the boss's proposition. "'You're mighty stingy with yourself these days,' said Mitty Beaver one night a month later, when he stopped on his way to school. Joe grinned somewhat foolishly. "'I come every evening,' he said. "'For about ten minutes,' said Mitty, with a toss of a voluminous pompadour. "'There's some once more in ten minutes.' "'Ben Shank?' asked Joe, alert with jealousy. "'I ain't saying,' went on Mitty. "'What do you do of nights, hang around the hall?' "'Naw,' nah, said Joe indignantly. "'There ain't nobody can say they've sawn me around the hall since I've went with you.' "'Well, where do you go?' "'I'm training,' said Joe evasively. "'I don't believe you like me as much as you used to,' said Mitty plaintively. Joe looked at her dumbly. His one thought from the time he cooked his own early breakfast down to the moment when he undressed in the cold and dropped in his place in bed between Gussie and Dick was of her. The love of her made his back stop aching as he bent hour after hour over the machine. It made the problems and hard words and new ideas at night school come straight at last. It made the whole sordid, ugly day swing round the glorious ten minutes that they spent together in the twilight. Yes, I like you all right he said, twisting his big, grease-stained hands in embarrassment. "'You're the onlyest girl I could ever care about. Besides, I couldn't go with no other girl if I wanted to, because I don't know none.' "'Is it small wonder that Ben Shank's glib protestations, reinforced by Mrs. Beaver's own zealous approval, 
Should have in time outclassed the humble Joe? The blow fell just when the second term of night school was over and Joe was looking forward to long summer evenings of unlimited joy. He had bought two tickets for a river excursion and was hurrying into the Beavers when he encountered a stolid bulwark in the form of Mrs. Beaver, whose portly person seemed permanently wedged into the narrow aperture of the front door. She sat in silent majesty, her hands just succeeding in clasping each other around her ample waist. Had she closed her eyes, she might have passed for a placid, amiable person, whose angles of disposition had also become curves. But Mrs. Beaver did not close her eyes. She opened them as widely as the geography of her face would permit, and coldly surveyed Joe Ritter. Mrs. Beaver was a born manager. She had managed her husband into an untimely grave. She had managed her daughter from the hour she was born. She had dismissed three preachers, induced two women to leave their husbands, and now dogmatically announced herself arbiter of fashions and conduct in Rear Ninth Street. No, she can't see you, she said firmly in reply to Joe's question. She's going out to a dance party with Mr. Shank. Where at? demanded Joe, who still trembled in her presence. Somewhere's downtown, said Mrs. Beaver, to a real swell party. He oughtn't to take her to no downtown dance, said Joe his indignation getting the better of his shyness. I don't want her to go, and I'm going to tell her so. Indeed, said Mrs. Beaver in scorn. And what have you got to say about it? I guess Mr. Shank's got the right to take her anywhere he wants to. What right? demanded Joe, getting suddenly a bit dizzy. Because he's got engaged to her. He's going to give her a real handsome turquoise ring, 14 carat gold. "'Didn't Mitty send me no word?' faltered Joe. "'No,' said Mrs. Beaver unhesitatingly, "'though she had in her pocket a note for him from the unhappy Mitty. "'Joe fumbled for his hat. "'I guess I'd better be going,' he said, a lump rising ominously in his throat. "'He got the gate open and made his way half-dazed round the corner.' As he did so, he saw a procession of small ridders bearing joyously down upon him. "'Joe!' shrieked Lottie, arriving first. "'Ma says hurry on home. We got another new baby to our house.' During the weeks that followed, Rear Ninth Street was greatly thrilled over the unusual event of a home wedding. The reticence of the groom was more than made up for by the bulletins of news issued daily by Mrs. Beaver. To use that worthy lady's own words, she was in her elements.' She organized various committees, on decoration, on refreshment, and even on the bride's trousseau, tactfully permitting each assistant to contribute in some way to the general grandeur of the occasion. "'I am going to have this a real showy wedding,' she said from her point of vantage by the parlor window, where she sat like a field marshal and issued her orders. "'Those paper fringes want to go clean across every one of the shelves,' and you all must make enough paper roses to pin round the edges of all the curtains. Everything's got to look gay and festive. Mitty don't look very gay, ventured one of the assistants. I seen her in the kitchen crying a minute ago. Mitty's a fool, announced Mrs. Beaver calmly. She don't know a good thing when she sees it. Get them draperies up a little higher in the middle. I'm going to hang a silver horseshoe onto the loop. The wedding night arrived, and the Beaver Cottage was filled to suffocation with the elite of Rear Ninth Street. The guests found it difficult to circulate freely in the room on account of the elaborate and aggressive decorations, so they stood in silent rows awaiting the approaching ceremony. As the appointed hour drew near and none of the groom's family arrived, a few whispered comments were exchanged. "'It's most time to begin,' whispered the preacher to Mrs. Beaver, whose keen black eyes had been watching the door with growing impatience. "'Well, we won't wait on nobody,' she said positively as she rose and left the room to give the signal. In the kitchen she found great consternation. The bride, pale and dejected in all her finery, sat on the table, all the chairs being in the parlor. "'What's the matter?' demanded Mrs. Beaver. "'He ain't come,' announced one of the women in tragic tones. "'Ben Shank ain't here?' asked Mrs. Beaver, in accents so awful that her listeners quaked. "'Well, I'll see the reason why.' Out into the night she sailed, 
picking her way around the puddles until she reached the saloon at the corner. "'Where's Ben Shank?' she demanded sternly of the men around the bar. There was an ominous silence broken only by the embarrassed shuffling of feet. Drawing herself up, Mrs. Beaver thumped the counter. "'Where's he at?' she repeated, glaring at the most embarrassed of the lot. "'He don't know where he's at,' said the man. "'I reckon he's celebrated a little too much for the wedding.' "'Can he stand up?' demanded Mrs. Beaver. "'Not without starching,' said the man, and amid the titter that followed, Mrs. Beaver made her exit. On the corner she paused to recoin her. Across the street was her gaily lighted cottage where all the guests were waiting. She thought of the ignominy that would follow their abrupt dismissal. She thought of the refreshments that must be used tonight or never. She thought of the little bride sitting disconsolate on the kitchen table. With a sudden determination, she decided to lead a forlorn hope. Facing about, she marched weightily around to the rear of the saloon and began laboriously to climb the, the steps that lead to the hall. At the door, she paused and made a rapid survey of the room until she found what she was looking for. "'Joe Ritter?' she called peremptorily. Joe, haggard and listless, put down his billiard cue and came to the door. Five minutes later, a breathless figure presented himself at the beaver kitchen. He had on a clean shirt and his Sunday clothes, and while he wore no collar, a clean handkerchief was neatly pinned about his neck. "'Everybody but the bride and groom come into the parlor,' commanded Mrs. Beaver. "'I'm gonna make a speech, and tell em that the bride has done changed her mind.' Joe and Mitty, left alone, looked at each other in dazed rapture. She was the first to recover. "'Joe!' she cried, moving timidly towards him. "'Ain't you mad? Do you still want me?' Joe, with both hands entangled in her veil and his feet lost in her train, looked down at her through swimming eyes. "'Want yer?' he repeated, and his lips trembled. "'Gee whiz! I feel like I've done ribbited a hoop round the whole world.' The signal was given for them to enter the parlor, and without further interruption the ceremony proceeded, if not in exact accordance with the plans of Mrs. Beaver, at least in obedience to the mandate of a certain little autocrat who sometimes takes a hand in the affairs of man, even in rear Ninth Street. End of Section 7 Recording by Gretchen Laboon, Columbus www dot such a voice dot com backslash spoken word